So uh, uh, I would like to thank all the organizers for this opportunity. And now I'm going to talk about uh, quantum thermodynamics and in particular about the optima driving of a thermal machine. And these are results that have been op obtained uh, in collaboration with uh, Vasco Cavina and Vittorio Giovannetti from Scuola Normale in Pisa and Alberto Carlini from the University of Piemonte Orientale. The talk is divided in two main parts that actually corresponds to two different papers. One has been published, the first one, and the second one still has to appear in the archive. So these are preliminary results. And uh, the first part of the talk will be about thermal machines that are driven slowly in the sense that you are close to thermodynamic equilibrium. But still, there are finite time effects. In the second part, I will ask about what is the optimal maximum power that you can extract from a quantum thermal machine. And in this regime, you can go very far from equilibrium. And then we will use a different approach based on a, a optimal control theory. So let's start with the slow driving of a thermal machine. So actually, the first part of this result, it's about open quantum systems. You don't have to uh, be specific uh, working on a, on a thermal machine. So we are interested in open quantum systems that can be described by a, a Markovian master equation. So you have a state, and then you have a differential equation, which is completely determined by the Liouvillian superoperator. And you can define the same object for a classical, for a quantum system. And then a very important property of a master equation is the concept of a fixed point. So this is a state which is invariant under the action of the Liouvillian. So it is a right eigenvector with zero eigenvalue. And if this is unique, and then if the, all other eigenvalues have negative real parts, then you exponentially, every solution, every initial state, converges exponentially to the fixed point, which is rho zero, uh, when time passes. Okay, this is a standard property of master equations. And now, assume that we can slowly change a parameter of this master equation, very slowly, much slower than the characteristic relaxation time of the system. And then what you expect is that you, the fixed point will change in time, so the gray, the gray line will change, and all the solutions will follow adiabatically this fixed point. This is, in some sense, the equivalent of a quasi-static transformation in thermodynamics. But this is a more general setting. And then the question is, what happens if I do exactly the same protocol, so exactly the same shape of the modulation, but faster and faster? At some point, the system will not be able to relax to the fixed point instantaneously. And so there will be a, a little bit of difference between the true solution and the uh, equilibrium solution. And then we, what we would like to do is to develop a perturbation theory to compute this difference. So the way to, to define this perturbation theory is to uh, rescale the time variable instead of going from zero to tau, which is the length of the driving of the system. We go from zero to one, with this dimensionless time variable. And then in this new variable, the, the length of the protocol appears only as a multiplicative factor in front of the master equation. And, and we can now expand as a perturbation series in one over tau, which is the length of the protocol, the solution. And what we expect is that in the limit of tau that goes to infinity, we recover the fixed point, the instantaneous fixed point of the dynamics. And for a finite tau, we'll have all other non-equilibrium corrections. And if you do replace this in the master equation, you can compute explicitly this, the, all the, these corrections in a perturbative way. And so now, for example, this is an example. We have a qubit in a, in a thermal bath, and we change the Hamiltonian along sigma x in our sinusoidal way, just a random example. You have uh, the, green, the gray line, which is the fixed point, the equilibrium solution. The real solution is the black one. 
And then you have the first order and second order analytical approximation that we could compute using this perturbation theory approach. So up to now, there was no thermodynamics. Thermodynamics enters into the game when you uh, impose that the fixed point is the Gibbs state associated with the instantaneous Hamiltonian of the system. And when you do this, just the, the expression is the same, just use the, the Gibbs state here for all these non-equilibrium corrections. And then you can ask what is the uh, entropy, internal energy, heat, work, using standard definitions that you have in open quantum systems. And if you just replace this perturbation series here, you get basically all the quantities that, are op that you can obtain at equilibrium when you do a process infinitely slowly, or all the non-equilibrium corrections automatically from this expression here. And uh, for example, these are the first order corrections to the energy, entropy, heat, work, and I don't go into the details, just that, that we have uh, basically the analytical formulas. And then what we are going to do is to apply this theory to a, a Carnot cycle. What is a quantum Carnot cycle in this setting? You can assume that you couple the system with a hot butt and you slowly change the Hamiltonian according to an arbitrary modulation. Then you apply a quench. So you multiply all the energy levels by a given constant. And then you apply the time reversal isothermal process. For example, if you compress a piston, you do the opposite uh, expansion. And, and then you do another quench. This is usually the definition of a Carnot cycle. And uh, you can compute with the previous expressions all the power, the efficiency, and so on. So for example, the power is for a cyclic process is related to the heat which is absorbed by the system, and, and you divide by the, the time that you are coupled with the hot and with the cold bath. So you have this expression, where here we truncate the previous perturbation series to first order in one over tau. And so we have this for the power, this for the efficiency. Of course, if you go to an infinite length of the process, you recover the Carnot efficiency and the power goes to zero, as, as usual in equilibrium thermodynamics. But if you instead optimize the power, you get the, an expression for the efficiency at maximum power. So this expression actually was known in the literature. And, uh, but what we can do now is you can just replace our analytical expressions for the, these quantities, these are non-equilibrium heat exchange, and we can go further in this approximation, in this calculation. So this is the ugly expression for the non-equilibrium dissipation, and it, unfortunately, unfortunately, it depends on the particular protocol, but uh, we are lucky that the fact that the ratio between the hot and the cold dissipation obeys this universal scaling law, where T cold and T hot are the temperatures, and alpha is the exponent of the spectral density. This is due to some symmetry property of the cycle and of the master equation. If you do this, we get our final first result, which is the efficiency at maximum power for a generic spectral density. And the nice property of this formula is that you recover all the many previous results that were obtained in the literatures uh, for different values of the spectral density, like for a flat bat, the most important case is the flat bat, in which we recover the curzon albor efficiency. And uh, this is a plot of the efficiency at maximum power for different values of alpha. And these are numerical simulations that follow quite well the analytical expressions for uh, low efficiency and low power. While when you go in the regime of high power, high efficiency, which is close to an, which is far from equilibrium, the perturbation theory doesn't work anymore. And so there is a, uh, at some point, this curve cannot be trusted anymore. 
in this region here. And that's the point of the second part of the talk. Because here, we were close to equilibrium, and at some point, we have to stop. But in the second part, we just brute force uh, optimize the power, and we don't care if you are close or far from equilibrium. And we do this using uh, optimal control theory, basically. Uh, so the general question is, I have a D-level quantum system, and I have two heat baths, a cold bath and a hot bath, and I can do whatever I want. I can change the Hamiltonian, I can couple with the hot, with the cold bath, with both if I want, and uh, I have only some limit on the damping rate, otherwise I could, the power would be infinite. And then the question is, what is the optimal cycle, the optimal strategy to extract the maximum amount of power? So to formalize the problem, again, we use a master equation approach in which we have the Hamiltonian, which now depends on external set, an external set of parameters. This is a vector u of t of controls, like the, I can change the, the frequency of a laser and so on. And also, I, I assume that I can control the damping constant with the cold and with the hot bath. And then, again, I can define the heat and the work as before. And the optimal control problem is the following. I want to minimize heat dissipation with respect to all possible strategies for fixed initial and final states and fixed length of the, of the protocol. Oh, uh, because uh, if you have a cycle, then the work is equal to minus Q, and we want to maximize the, the power. I think it's, it could be equivalent, but uh, in the end, that's uh, maybe simpler to do the calculation, but... Yes, because I would say yes, because... Uh, I want to optimize the power. I don't care if the entropy production, what is the entropy production? I just want maximum work, and then I want maximum work divided by tau. So that's the most direct way to do it. But I agree that you can change the figure of merit if well, you. Just because I doubt that they are independent, but anyway, The system can be in every state. I just. Yes, I agree. So you have these problems where there is no uh, universal agreement on what is the definition, but these problems are usually when the system has coherence. If you have, a, you have super, uh, off diagonal terms, then you have these uh, extra terms to the work that are, so this, uh, in the end, what I'm going to apply is a situation in which you have diagonal states. So everything is well defined. Even if, of course, if you have uh, coherences, you should be careful about what is the interpretation of this quantity, basically. Okay. So how can we do this optimization? We want to minimize Q, and then we use a Lagrange multiplier approach, because we minimize Q with respect to all possible trajectories that are normalized and obey the master equation. And the way to do this is to use Lagrange multipliers, which is a number for the normalization, and actually an operator for the, for, to impose the master equation. It's a standard approach to, to, basically to do Lagrange optimization in control theory. And a nice feature of this Lagrangian approach is that, as in classical mechanics, you can define the analog of the Hamiltonian. Also in this case, you have uh, the pseudo-Hamiltonian, pseudo which, which has nothing to do with the Hamiltonian of the system. It's just a mathematical object that is very useful to find optimal solutions. And as in classical mechanics, you have the, the so-called uh, the analog of the Hamilton equations that just gives the dynamics of rho, which is just the master equation. This is something that we know. But then we have this non-trivial solution for this auxiliary 
state, which is something like a density matrix, that evolves according to a different master equation. This is like position and momentum, if you want. And again, as in classical mechanics, the Hamiltonian is conserved. That's a very useful property to find solutions. So what, what is exactly the Pontryagin's minimum principle? It's a, a statement about optimal solutions that uh, should satisfy three properties. So they are necessary conditions. All optimal solutions are such that there exists this auxiliary state that evolves according to this equation, just the Hamilton equation. The pseudo-Hamiltonian pseudo is minimized by the control field at every time. And the Hamiltonian is constant, as I said before. So these three properties, in principle, are not enough in general to completely specify the optimal solution. But they are very useful. And if you are lucky, they are also enough to, to find it. And uh, so now one could ask, OK, we have this nice Hamiltonian, which in general, in control theory, has no physical meaning. Maybe in this case, it could be related with some thermodynamic quantity. And this is the case. And it is strongly related to the maximum power of the cycle. Because if we take the power, which is just minus the heat divided by tau, we take the variation of this power we get a term which is proportional to the variation of the heat, and a term proportional to the variation of tau. Then we use our Hamiltonian, which is linked to the, this uh, Lagrange optimization. And what we find is that optimal solution should have p equal to minus k. So when you are at maximum power, then the optimal solution as a power, which is just minus k. This is this, this conserved quantity of the control problem. So this tells us that we, we have a clear optimization procedure. We just take the set of all possible values of this conserved quantity that are consistent with the uh, master equation and the Hamilton equations. We check if the power is equal to minus k. And if this is the case, then we know that this is the optimal power solution. Otherwise, we should try a larger value of k. But as you're going to show for your qubit, the first, the minimum k, is already a good solution. So, but before going to the qubit, we may ask, what's the uh, general cycle for a D-level quantum system in general? What's the kind of transformation that are optimal? And uh, if you first optimize the damping rates, you find that it turns out that uh, the best strategy is a bang-bang type control. So you couple a maximum rate with the hot butt, or you couple with, at maximum rate with the cold, uh, cold butt. There are no intermediate situations. Plus, what is the optimal control for the Hamiltonian? It is a regular driving along isothermal transformations. But you can have also here some discontinuity, some bang-bang effects. And these are exactly the equivalent of adiabatic transformation in a Carnot engine. So we know that finite time Carnot cycles are optimal solution, and we have to optimize over these cycles. So this is the general theory. Now we, I apply this to the qubit. I don't know. Maybe I have five minutes. Yes. Yeah. Maybe. OK. Uh, then let's apply this to the qubit. For the qubit, we assume that we can couple the system with two baths of cold and hot temperature that just tends to thermalize the system to the Gibbs state. This is a thermalizing dissipator. And moreover, we assume that we can modulate externally the gap of a two-level system by simply rising or lowering the, level, the energy level of the excited state. The ground state is at zero energy. So as I said, here we consider diagonal uh, qubit. We have also the diagonal uh, auxiliary system in terms of a single variable, Q. We have this pseudo-Hamiltonian that we can compute. And we have this pseudo-Hamilton equations that does, uh, they just give the master equation for the state. 
and a kind of master equation for the auxiliary state. And then we have just to solve these equations. But the cost state, of course, it's not a physical state. It's a, actually, it's a zero trace object. And uh, these are the solutions that we get. That's the optimal is isothermal, cold isothermal process, optimal hot isothermal process for a given value of kappa in the U P plane. What does it mean? This is the probability of excitation. That's the state. And this is the energy. And so by definition, you can compute the heat as the integral as this area below the curve, let's say. And uh, this is the heat uh, dissipated in the hot isotherm. In the cold isotherm, this is the heat absorbed in the hot isotherm. But as I said before, you can switch between one uh, isothermal process to the other with a quench. And so you can do a Carnot cycle, basically. And actually, our control theory approach tell, tells us exactly what are the optimal points where we should apply the quench. So there, not every Carnot cycle is optimal. Only one Carnot cycle is optimal for a given value of kappa. So we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between kappa and Carnot cycles. We take the Carnot cycle with the minimum value of kappa, and we hope that this is the maximum power heat engine. What happens when you go to the minimum value is that the Carnot cycle basically collapses to a, to a very small Carnot cycle where the isothermal process is basically a, a constant Hamiltonian process. And then you can say that this is an uh, infinitesimal Otto cycle. And this is exactly the, the optimal control uh, uh, result. You have to go to one particular state with a given value of optimal P star for a given temperature ratio here. And then around this state, this quantum state, you switch the energy level between two particular values of U. And uh, you do this exactly as in a standard Otto cycle. I change the energy level, I thermalize a little bit, I change the energy level, I thermalize in the opposite path. And if I do this, I obtain exactly the maximum power of the heat cycle, and uh, for which we have this curve, and we also have the optimal asymptotic, the asymptotic expansion in the limit of high power and also an upper bound which cannot never be violated. And we can also compute the efficiency at maximum power, which is the blue line here. And the green line is the curzon alborn efficiency. We are very close. And uh, yeah, this is the, the full solution for the qubit. So to summarize, I have presented two different approaches to study optimal driving of thermal machines. The first approach is based on a perturbation theory, which uh, is good when you have a master equation in which you slowly change some parameters of the master equation. And uh, in this case, you get many universal results, but they are not good at maximum power. Actually, they are not good at uh, far from equilibrium. And the second part, instead, we studied optimal driving of a thermal machine using a control theory approach. And I've shown you that optimal cycles are finite time Carnot cycles, that the reason the maximum power is, is, is linked to this conserved quantity of the control problem, kappa. And using this formalism, we could derive the full solution for a two-level system close or out of equilibrium. Thank, thank you very much.